good afternoon, everyone. I am, my name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. I am very, very pleased to see all of you here. I apologize for the delay uh, in terms of having these little technical glitches that, as we all know, do happen from time to time, but thank you for your patience. And I am so glad that you are all here because the topic before us today is one of such great importance in terms of looking at the challenges and opportunities for communities of color and tribal nations as we look at the issues that are confronting us with regard to climate change. We have a wonderful array of speakers and sponsoring organizations, and I hope that you all feel very, very good about the array of organizations that have come together today in terms of organizing this briefing. Our own EESI, as well as the Friends Committee on National Legislation, the National Congress of American Indians, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Mahapa Band of Paiute Indians, and also the Franciscan Action Network. So this just gives you a sense of indeed all of the people who really, really care about this. There have been other briefings with regard to these issues on the Hill. Uh, there was a, a, another briefing related to the whole issue of climate uh, uh, and looking at impacts up on the Latino community a couple weeks ago. So I think that it is incumbent upon all of us to really think about these very, very important issues of social, environmental, and economic justice as we look at these huge challenges facing us. With that said, I am so pleased to be able to introduce to you Congressman Grijalva, who has come across the hill uh, from the House, and we know that that is a very big deal uh, to come to the other body. And uh, Congressman Grijalva is, uh, it represents the state of Arizona, and he has been a wonderful, wonderful leader. Uh, is a co-chair of the Progressive Caucus on the House side, is on the House Education and Labor Committee. He brings a real history of advocacy and, and deep commitment uh, for people of all, um, uh, of all economic, social, and, uh, and ethnic uh, orient orientation and derivation. So we are very, very pleased to have somebody who is up to the challenge that is facing all of us and who is providing such terrific leadership in the Congress. Congressman? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, we'll thank uh, Friends, Committee on National Legislation, of course the National Congress for American Indians, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and uh, always, uh, great advocates and great sources of information uh, that uh, at least I and other colleagues utilize all the time. That's the Environment and Energy Study Institute and the Mahapa uh, Band of Paiute Indians and the Franciscan Action Network for organizing this briefing, a very important briefing. Uh, uh, mentioning economic and social justice and, and I think it's, it's link to the subject of climate change and to the reality of climate change. Uh, I, we, we walked across the impasse to, to get here today. Uh, it's, it's good to see how the other half lives once in a while, you know. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's the two year versus six year elections, which is a comfort zone here that we don't quite have yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, climate change is real. And, and we need to start being much more proactive about dealing with the challenges. Uh, we're starting to see the realities of climate change across the world and certainly in our country. Extreme weather events, the wildfires that are going to come, the drought throughout this country. And uh, while it didn't snow much here in Washington, D.C., it did in downtown Tucson, where I'm from. I think it's the fifth time in my lifetime. Uh, and, uh, and this summer, uh, scientists have uh, predicted the hottest uh, April and May in recorded history for the state of Arizona and big sots of the Southwest. Uh, and so I hope that people are, be people are beginning to realize that we need to deal with climate change. People are realizing it 
policymakers have yet to come to grips with that reality. When you have uh, a community uh, in this country, and, and let me use Latinos, where 74% of Latinos believe climate change is real and something needs to be done with urgency, a population that sometimes uh, pundits will say really only care about jobs and only care about immigration and only care about those vital issues to their existence in this country, uh, how wrong they can be. And so when you have a population that was most affected in many areas, as poor people and people of color are in this country by climate change, have, dealing with issues of poverty, dealing with issues of population concentration, dealing with issues of lack of resources to be able to create their own individual adaptations to this change. Uh, you're seeing about who, who is it in this country that will be most impacted by climate change and who will suffer the consequences of that climate change to a greater degree. Everybody will. Every school I go to to talk to young people, and that is, uh, that's been the audience for climate change for quite a while. Go to talk to them, and we'll talk about the pressing issues in this country, and inevitably, across gender, across class, across ethnicity, comes the question about climate change, and what are you going to do about it, and what is Congress doing about it. And, uh, and I think as we go forward with this issue, uh, and either way you look at, at the numbers, they're compelling. Uh, there's widespread uh, support for action and climate ch on climate change, and it's time that we, as policymakers, as elected officials, and as advocates, uh, took that mandate and ran with it. We have to send the world a message that we are, want to lead and will lead before it's too late. And part of the leadership issue is going to have to adaptation strategies for, for our country. And I'm concentrated on the public lands where adaptation uh, to climate change can be a very good incubator for issues that we can deal on a broader scale across the country and the world. And also uh, dealing with the administration about significant monument designations across this country to not only preserve watershed, habitat, but begin the adaptation strategy that links habitats and that links communities across this country. Uh, many will say well, we have so many other pressing issues. Uh, we, have, we have the budget and sequestration. We have all these things that we must deal with first before we deal with the urgency of climate change. And, and those pressing issues are not only facing us, they're facing the world. And that's why when we submitted our budget that will be on the floor tomorrow, uh, from the Progressive Caucus, we, uh, we priced uh, carbon at $25 a ton to begin to uh, making polluters and the primary suppliers of fossil uh, fuel sources in this country responsible by reducing emissions and uh, the levels of major impact. Our budget also within that 25 includes a rebate to make sure that poor people, low-income people, people without the means will be held harmless through this process and through this $25 per ton charge. And I'm looking forward to working with Senator Whitehouse, with Representative Waxman, that I think beginning tomorrow we will begin putting aside floor time to talk about the, the topic of climate change over and over again. Uh, and. Uh, because I think it deserves center stage in, in the political dialogue in this country. Uh, we can wait for 100% of the scientists to say it is true instead of 97%. I think that would be kind of a waste of time on our part. But uh, that's the kind of head in the sand attitude that some of my colleagues are taking about the issue. Something else is always too important and we can put this off. The urgency demands that we not put it off we bring it center stage and make it part of the political dialogue and debate. I, uh, we hear a lot from my colleagues across the aisle that our nation's debt will create impassable burden for future generations. So we must do these drastic, immediate, deep, and lasting spending cuts.
to bring that under control. I would wish they would harness that same kind of empathy for future generations when we deal with the subject of climate change. That we need to do something immediate, deep, and lasting. I, uh, I want to just thank everybody. It's, a, it's an important topic, and it's a topic that I think the American people, I believe the American people, are behind us doing something, and doing something immediate, and doing something that will lead us to a lasting method and sequence to meet the challenge. It's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough to have intellectual and scientific discourse about the subject of climate change. It's an, now it's become an action item. And those of us who believe that the challenges and the effects of climate change on the overall quality of life of this world, on the threat to all species and this species in particular, as we speak about it, is, is, is a challenge we cannot turn our back on. It is the equivalent of many other challenges we've faced in the past. And I think the ingenuity and the discipline of the American people will lead the way. But first, we're going to have to get the people that make decisions in this place, the people that are in power in this place, the policy makers in this place, that if they can't lead us to confront those challenges, that they get out of the way and let the American people lead us to, the, to confront those challenges. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I think that there's always an opportunity. And uh, my wife says I'm a masochist too, by the way. And uh, so it's a kind of weird masochist, optimist kind of a bipolar thing I work with through my life. Uh, but I really see a great chance. When you have organizations as diverse as the ones in front of you, when you see a unifying issue like climate change, bringing communities of what was perceived to be diverse interest into a common cause that is very, very powerful. And our task ahead of us is to turn our knowledge and our advocacy into action and to begin to do what we have to do and what we do best, to mobilize, educate, and unify around this issue so that the movement for meeting the challenge becomes overwhelming. And then, if need be, the people that make decisions will follow. Thank you very much, and I'm very honored to be here with you. And I must say, uh, the Congressman is somebody that we really welcome the opportunity. I think all of us welcome the opportunity to work closely with him and through his roles on the Committee on Resources and Education and Workforce in the House, it also provides uh, an important opportunity to really raise a voice for these important issues on climate and how to best address them. Uh, I now would like to turn to our lead co-sponsor with regard to this briefing, to Diane Randall, who is the Executive Secretary with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And of course, the Friends Committee is very well known for uh, having been an important institution in this city for a lot of years, since 1943, and has been a very, very important leader on peace and social justice issues. Diane. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by thanking Senator Cantwell for her assistance with today's briefing and to the staff of the Senate S Committee on Indian Affairs for securing this beautiful room for us to hold the briefing in. I also want to thank the Senator for, Senator for her leadership on climate change. Her thoughtful work on the CLEAR Act has helped frame legislative opportunity for placing a cap on carbon emissions and generating revenue, much of which would re be returned to the American people. I also want to thank Representative Garlava for his steadfast commitment to the people in this country who live paycheck to paycheck, pay, paycheck, or sometimes even without a paycheck, but who often bear the dramatic impact of climate disruption. FCNL is the oldest 
and largest registered faith-based peace lobby in the United States, is pleased to stand shoulder to shoulder with the NAACP, the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization, and the National Congress on American Indians, the nation's oldest and largest intertribal organization. With the chairman of the Moapa tribe and representatives of the Center for Social Inclusion and Green for All, people who meet great challenges with smart and tangible results. Thank you to the Franciscan Action Network for co-sponsoring and to the Environmental and Energy St Study Institute who worked closely with us to make this briefing successful. FCNL is a Quaker lobby in the public interest. We're working here on the Hill and we're represented by citizen lobbyists throughout the United States asking for legislation that will bring about a more peaceful and just world. Our office, located right across the street in the Senate Hart Building, is the first LEED certified building on Capitol Hill. We invite you to tour our green building to see how a ge geothermal system on a small urban footprint works and to consider the use of our conference space for your meetings. We are asking Congress to act on climate change, perhaps the greatest challenge facing us today. A concern based on the belief that all of us share an obligation, care for create, an obligation to care for creation and all people, especially the most vulnerable, because every person holds the light of God within them. This concern about climate change is a nonpartisan and a moral issue shared by many faith traditions. Last December, we hosted another climate briefing in the House where voices from the evangelical, Jewish, and Catholic faith traditions witnessed our concerns and our hopes for action from our political leaders. And there's a, there's a, a handout outside about different faith perspectives on climate change. In seeking an Earth Restored, we seek mobilization of many peoples to address this great challenge. And we seek especially the leadership from Congress as a critical partner to address climate change with solutions that are commensurate to the scale of impacts and threats to our present and our future well-being. FCNL is on the Hill today with over 100 of our young adults from across the country for our Spring Lobby Weekend. They are meeting with their representatives asking Congress to take up this leadership role, to express bipartisan recognition of the science and gravity of man-made client disruption and commit to action, to set a price on the cap uh, or a cap on carbon pollution that significantly reduces greenhouse gas emissions, such as offered in the Sanders-Boxer bill, or through reintroduction of the CLEAR Act that had the leadership of both Senators Cantwell and Collins in a previous Congress, and to catalyze energy efficiency measures in ways that create jobs and reduce costs for business and homeowners through reintroductions of Senators Shaheen and Portman's Energy Savings and Industrial Competitiveness Act. Congress can lead by responding to the call expressed by three quarters of the American people, by people of many faiths, by people of color, our nation's first peoples, for action on climate change. Regardless of party, faith, color, or place of origin, we can address climate change with hope and action on real solutions for a better solution for our future, our earth, our children, and for generations to come. Thanks, Diane. I would now like to turn to our next speaker, who is Jacqueline Peta, who is the Executive Director of the National Congress of American Indians, which, as, as you just heard, is the oldest and largest American Indian and Alaska Native advocacy organization in the United States. NCAI advocates on behalf of tribal governments and communities promoting strong tribal nation to federal government, nation to nation policies, as well as promoting a, a better understanding, growing understanding among the general public regarding American Indian and Alaska Native governments, people, and rights. Jacqueline has been, um, uh, she was in the uh, Clinton administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Native American Programs of the U.S. Department of Housing and HUD, and we are so pleased to have her with us today. Jacqueline. Thank you. My Hlinket name, I, I'm, my name is Kusin, and I come from Hluka. So let me tell you about what Hluka means. 
So a long, long time ago, and I'm not going to take this story to tell forever to tell you the whole part of it, but a long, long time ago, we actually, our people have a story where we came across and we came, uh, where, we, where we actually came through the ice and in seek of new, uh, fresher salmon, because as the streams were coming into the interior or into um, where from Canada side, we saw that the fish were fresher if we would follow them a little bit further out. There was a two women who decided, the old women, they were beyond char char, um, uh, childbirthing years, and they said yes, they, they would go in the cave, uh, go underneath the ice to see if we could get out to the fresher and get fresher salmon earlier. And so they came out, and we came, and that's where we ended up coming out um, over there by Wrangell, Alaska, Southeast Alaska. Anyway, the place that we ended up coming, our clan comes from Pluka, so I am the people from Pluka. And, um, and I guess that just wants to, I just wanted to tell you that a little bit of that story because it really is about tribal nations and how we've adapted to climate change for centuries. And we've had dramatic forces in and outside of our communities as we, you know, um, as, as we deal with our, the world and the life that we live within. And, but Mother Earth always taught us about what the environment, um, what, about the environment and how we adapt with that environment. But the, cha the, the challenging thing for us right now is the climate change is, the change is less predictable. And it actually has a huge human influence on our lives right now. And we fa face major changes in the way of our life. So at NCAI, one of our great challenges is how do we, uh, we always say we want to focus on solutions and the possibilities. I'm always positive, progressive. That's the, what I always say. And so we are a people of hope and we are people that have moving forward to lead to our survival. Our theme this year that we kind of captured to talk about is called securing our futures. And there's so many reasons why this theme is important to us. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how tribal nations are securing their futures as we deal with this issue. Give you a quick synopsis. I'm not sure if my screen is working or not and whether or not you see that. But real quickly, um, tribal nations are very much present. I want to be able to make sure you know that. Um, we're not in your history books. We're actually alive and, and living and thriving. Um, and there's about 566 tribal nations across the, federally recognized tribes across the country and many other state recognized tribes. 229 of those tribes and villages are in my state of Alaska. And the remaining tribes are in 34 other states. There's 5.2 million American Indian and Alaska Native people and there's over 100 million acres of total land mass in the American Indian and Alaska Native control. This would make the fourth largest state in the United States. So as we look at that land ma mass, and we also recognize that American Indian tribes are probably, are some of the most, live in the most rural areas of the country. And our people, unfortunately, are still some of the most poorest people in this country. Um, eight of the 10 uh, poorest counties in the nation are in tribal communities. Um, and so you see that there is a devastating effect of climate change is having on our traditional way of life. Um, in Alaska, for example, you see um, Alaska, like the village of Kavalina, where the sea is eroding the village and the village is having to deal with relocation. You see our hunt traditional hunting and gathering places, whether you're in Alaska or in the lower 48, um, but you also see how that ch is changing the patterns of migration, like the caribou, for example. You see that fishing is decreasing as well as the warmer waters are having negative effects of spawning in the habitat and oxygen supply. And of course, even our traditional medicines are disappearing and putting our health needs in jeopardy. We also always talk about the high cost of fuels and sadly these effects are taking effect all over. So, this next picture tells you a little bit about what the front lines look like, and if we had time, we'd see the video, but I'm going to make sure that you guys, or however, you can go to our website, get a copy of this video, and the, uh, of this PowerPoint, and you can download and look at that video. But this is about the Kuskokwim River, and you heard about last summer, where the folks from the villages of Akiak, uh, a village of Akiak, were trying to make a decision as they were dealing with their, their harvest of their, for subsistence of, their, of the king salmon and was really important. And as they went to prepare their nets to go fishing, they were told by the, um, 
the, the state and federal wildlife officials that they couldn't fish because of the because of the low um, uh, numbers of fish, and so. 21 of their nets were seized, and, and obviously a hundred, a thousands of pounds of, of salmon were from subsist, of fishermen were subsist, subsist. But what we really see here is the effect of climate change. We have low salmon runs, and we've had low salmon runs before, and they come and go, but, substan but continually having low sa salmon runs. And what it really challenges is a community like Akiak. Who, re who recognizes in their traditional ways. In my village, we don't, we don't even fish the first run of the salmon. We wait so the first run actually has its cycle of life and we take from the second run. Or we wait until the lake bubbles and we know that there's enough fish there because they're feeding and, they're bu and the lake is bubbling before we take. Those are the lessons my elders taught me when I was a child growing up and learning how to subsist. But Akiak had to make a difficult decision in the way of life. Is can I, can I really go without my fish for this season? How will I feed my children? How will I sustain my life? Versus how do we decide which is available for commercial oper um, opportunities versus for that, for that livelihood of subsistence? Tough decisions that are being made as we deal with the effect of what I think is climate change. And so then we go and we see other effects of, of climate change on Native American communities. We've got the biggest wildfires of last year. Where were they? Predominantly in Indian country. And we were having to deal with, can we actually light a fire? I remember one of my biggest issues last year in the fall was, can we light a fire to do our ceremonies when we have trying to deal with the blazing fires around us. And how else do we do our ceremonies? How else can we pray if we go to our sacred places to be able to take that week of praying? Challenges. We see, I talked to the Klamath, Klamath tribal leader last week, and uh, actually last week we were both at res, sitting yeah. to, next to each other, and who was going through their water settlements. Out of the 12 regions of the country, 11 regions have said water issues of tribal leaders is their number one priority as we're dealing with those issues. And so we deal with the Passamaquoddy tribes in Maine who is dealing with traditional medicines and, 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 and lack of those. You'll see the next slide is we have um, um, our opportunity for securing the future. Indian country, as I talked about the large land mass, we see as an opportunity for dealing with alternative energy. We've been working with the Department of Energy, we've been working with members of Congress to be able to make sure that those barriers are removed, that tribes actually have the same opportunities to develop alternative energy and energy that will be necessary for our communities and we also practice that. And so we'll see that Department of Energy has dealt with some small community energy but some larger energy um, um, projects. You also see tribal leaders in this slide. The first stewards last year having a conference here in Washington DC saying we as tribal people and traditional people have some ideas up to put forward, some solutions that we want to put forward to address. And some of those solutions are in this next slide which is you'll see the, um, the Winnebago tribe, uh, the Ho-Chunk people of Winnebago. And we went out there last year and actually saw the windmills in their small housing complex. Didn't totally take away the energy needs, but certainly supplemented it, made it more affordable, and certainly a clean, a clean energy project. And of course, their solar panels that were actually helping them with their tribal operations and their tribal businesses and being able to install those. In the next slide here, you see a copy of what we think is really important, and that's that next generation. Being able to be able to get the next generation to capture the vision, to be able to have those tools and techniques in the way that we probably may not have as, as we're older generation, and we're the oldest and largest um, Native American organizations sitting here with many other oldest and largest. We want to be able to make sure that we're seeking solutions for the community. We have examples of that where in Arctic Village, they're actually just trying to figure out how to optimize their community powerhouse and energy. In Pascayaki, they're doing their solar panel, panel um, generation. And Pascamaquati is doing wind farm. Um, you'll see here, um, and I, I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to go really quickly, but we have the large-scale project. This is actually in um, Gus Frank of Forest Cow County, Potawatomi, has actually taken this environmental um, project and, and being able to install it, not only for their casino, but also for their tribal operations and for their communities. 
We see the importance of this conversation to help us not only with our energy needs, but also with our economic needs and our jobs needs. As we prepare for the future, as we look to the seventh generation, we are looking for opportunities to be engaged in all of those issues, agriculture, water, fish and wildlife, energy, forestry, and so long. And as I said, to Indian country, this is really about the next generations. A tribal leader, Fawn Sharp from the Quinault Nation, she's made a statement that I'll never forget, and I remind myself of it all the time, that every decision we make today is really a decision for those generations in the future, and we need to make that as conscientiously as we can. Thank you. Goodness, Chish. Uh, thank you so much, Jacqueline, and I think that it is so important for us to always remember that everything, as you said, everything that we do affects so many other things for a very long period of time, so it means that we should all be very careful in terms of those decisions. So I am now very pleased to uh, introduce William Anderson, who was born and raised on the Moapa Band of Paiutes Reservation. And he brings a very interesting perspective, too, because as he went on to school, received a degree in communications, he also worked in advertising, ran for tribal council. So he was elected tribal chairman in 2000 and remains uh, 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 council chairman. And he also brings perspective as a business owner. So therefore, he is able in his leadership to bring forward that experience as a, as a business person and as a tribal leader to really help look at what does make sense for the future in terms of working with his people and the land. William. Mr. Chairman. The, do we have the video yet? We think, we, we think so, and I was just going to say too, in terms of the PowerPoints and the video for um, your, your video, as, there you go. Gonna ruin your okay, it, it will all be available on EESI's website as well. The contractors, when, when I was working with them, they'd go ahead and say, you know, it's uh, pretty much a death trap. You breathe in this stuff, you're, it's gonna ruin your body. Usually I talk on the phone, I say, there's blowing across the window, I can see it, you know, and I just don't go outside and I don't walk those states. On its worst day, it, it would be like walking in a sandstorm. You can't really breathe, it's just there. We've got a warning and there's going to be a lot of coal ash flying around. At least don't let my son or daughter go out. I can taste it. Taste the salts going down in my throat. So you can't get out. You're essentially in prison, in prison in your own home. The Reed Gardner Power Station sits right next to the Moapa River Reservation. It's just one of the more than 600 coal fired power plants across America, but it like every other coal plant, has a dirty little secret. It's called coal ash, and it's making people sick. Coal ash is the toxic waste generated by every lump of coal we burn. It's laced with arsenic, mercury, lead, and other toxic metals. It's the second largest waste stream in America, and it's subject to less regulation than the garbage you take to the curb every week. At Reed Gardner, the coal ash is put into landfills and mixed with water and dumped into ponds. And then, when the wind blows just wrong, it picks up like a sandstorm and blows right out the reservation. It's just one of the hundreds of places across America where coal ash is threatening communities and making people sick. I want to be out. I want to be able to do what the Constitution of the United States says. That I have the right for happiness. Well, I don't have that now. I, I, when the wind blows, I'm a prisoner. I go back to jail. The coal ash ponds at Reed Gardner start at the plant and then stretch across the desert to within a few hundred yards of the homes on the Moapa River Reservation. The prevailing winds carry constant pollution straight at the Paiute people who live there. And despite the high documented rates of lung, heart, and thyroid disease, 
The Reed Gardner plant is currently trying to expand their coal ash ponds and landfills. I live the closest to the ponds and then the, and, uh, the blowing dust. And I get all of it every time that blows. Uh, I get sick from the air that is coming, being blown towards us. Fatigue, uh, headaches, nosebleeds, dizziness. You know, I suffer from all that. And that's what they acknowledge. It's what they don't acknowledge. You know, the document that addresses the chromiums, the manganese, the leads, the, you know, all of the other bad stuff. I mean, what long-term effect does that have? I've never had asthma until I moved here. I now have to use an inhaler. And my little girl got her first inhaler last week. Well, I was um, diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. I've had a sore throat for six months. I associate it with that plant because after reading the chemicals and the poisons in there, It has to be. You flip on a light switch. That power does not come from that light switch. That power is generated somewhere else and it impacts people. Uh, my daughter was just born and he had just had his daughter and they lived on top of the hill overlooking the power plant and that's where he worked. And he worked so hard that he didn't even know that he was sick. He was waiting three weeks for a new heart and he didn't get one and he died. So I just started thinking about, you know, how much all that coal dust was on my brother. Many people on the reservation decided they're tired of being polluted on from the outside. Now they're looking for solutions to this problem on the inside. So at the same time the Reed Gardner plant is trying to expand its coal ash storage capability, the Moapa Paiutes are trying to show a different way forward. One that uses the resources that are already there and moves us past coal. Oh, I'm working for a green energy and um, where we're gonna have a solar plant. And so I think we're the first tribe in the United States to be putting this uh, plant on a reservation at this uh, large scale. So I guess I'm really um, proud and I'm kind of their first worker. Oh pollution, no nothing, no sound or smell or nothing coming from it. You know, to go ahead and be a part of that connection, to be connected with the sun, making it into energy. To be, to be that connected with nature, Mother Earth, plants, rocks, animals. I mean, that's basically who we are. You know, that's what we started out with. You know, back before this was a reservation. You know, that's how our people were from back then, lived off, lived from the earth. In some ways, I just feel like the Indian people are here uh, for a reason, and maybe it's to try to help do what we can to preserve the environment. We can't not just sit here and just take it, but to go ahead and do something about it. You know, we want to go ahead and have a solar project, say, hey, you know, there's alternative ways. We are doing it. We are trying to go ahead and be more, uh, more positive. We're trying to be more, uh, more active. We're trying to be more you know, more uh, supportive with regard to the, the environment. For years, Reed Gardner and hundreds of other Mr. Chairman, it's all yours. <laughs> yeah, I can take it from there. Great, great. Uh, you saw just a portion of what we've been facing. This was two years ago was when this was made. And that one of the men that were on here, Calvin Myers, he said he lived closest to the power plant. He is now, he's in the hospital right now. He uh, faced a stroke. And before that stroke, he had a heart attack. His brother, who lived with him, respiratory problems, heart problems, he's passed away this past year, too. These are the problems that are facing our people every day. Our elders, they're dying off. For a while, it was getting very scary because it was being, uh, like every two months, one of our elders would pass away. The uh, people that live closest to the reservation, 
they have so many respiratory problems, so many problems dealing with the issues with coal, that it's, uh, it, it just got to, to a point where a bunch of us started asking, where I asked our people, who do you know that has respiratory problems, who has health problems, heart problems, anything like that? And one by one, they kept on saying, my cousin has this, my uncle has that, my aunt has these problems. Thyroid has been a big issue. It's the highest concentration of thyroid in a small, little, small reservation. And to have these type of numbers on a small reservation for health problems, it's just, you know, it just really just blows my mind away just to, just to see those numbers. For us to go ahead and deal with these issues every day, that cloud, that white cloud, that's the fugitive dust that's blowing over from those um, from those ponds. You know, this is a desert community where we get up to 115 degrees weathers, and there's times where the wind blows up to 40 to 60 miles an hour. It comes down, it picks up that particulate matter, and blows over into the homes. Those homes are not fitted to go ahead and take this to to block it all out, so it's taken into the homes. The people try to go ahead and move indoors now that they see it. Our people, that uh, even our elders, that just want to go outside, work on their yard, just to go ahead and just to clean up uh, the yard and work on their, you know, everything that they have growing there, their skin starts to burn. And then they have to go back inside to go ahead and you know, get away from what's going on outside. The smell is so bad when it comes from blowing over from the, from the uh, power plant that it's just we have our own culture events that last all night. And we bring, invite other tribes to come in during this time. And during these cultural events, they're out there and they're smelling this bad smell. And, you know, there's like, what is that smell? And it's like, well, it's coming from the power plant. All these different issues that's been coming up has been something that we were just sitting there just taking it. And we didn't know what was, what was you know, what was going on. We had the companies tell us that, well, that's your genetics. That's just who you are. And the allergies that you're having, that's just who your people are. But how can we have allergies when we've been the indigenous people that's been there generations after generations before anybody else showed up out there? That land is very sacred to us. That out there in the desert, like she was saying before, water is our greatest resource that we have. It goes right through the reservation and continues on into the Colorado River. So with that going on with the pond liners that are right there, there's some that are not even not lined. And it's wonder to see what has seeped through and got into that river to move on where Las Vegas is right there too. They pump in that water for their own drinking purposes also. We try to go ahead and let them know about the information that we have, but it's, no one wants to listen to us. I've been, uh, when I first came here, the very first year that uh, part of my term was that I started to go ahead and hear about the problems that people were facing across the country regarding coal. And for me, growing up on the reservation, I just didn't understand that, you know, it was just, well, that's just how things were. But it turns to find out a lot of people that live closest to the coal plants are facing the exact same problems that we've been facing. And, and, and for me to realize that, to go ahead and see, like, you know, now, geez, it's not just us. I brought that back home and I told our people about these issues that we're facing and what we should do about it. We've been starting a campaign to go ahead and do anything we could to go ahead and show them what, we could, what needs to be done. And what, one of the main things we've been trying to focus on was getting the awareness out there. We've been trying to go ahead and work together with other groups like the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, and so many other organizations that's out there, uh, Earth Justice here in D.C., um, just so many that we've been trying to go ahead and work with to go ahead and get these, this issue ac across. Earth Justice was the one that uh, came out here and uh, made this documentary for us. They went ahead and sent a person out there to go ahead and uh, do this for us, so it's Chris Jordan. So that was the first year, and then once we started to get the grassroots started going with our people, that was, the main, that was the hardest part, was getting our people involved. Once we got our people involved, to get them aware of what's going on and to talk about their problems, the uh, issues that we're facing, we had to go ahead and talk with the EPA. The EPA was going to go ahead and host the meeting regarding uh, the issues that were going on, but they were going to have it like 25 miles away from the reservation. And their excuse was, was that there was no place that, could, that had a hall available to go ahead and host this. I go, well, we have a hall, we have a PA system, we have our own tribal police, we have everything you need, and we're just a half mile away from the, the power plant. So they go, well, we already put it to the registry, we can't go ahead and go, couldn't have that meeting. Um, but it took a lot of persuasion and a lot of talk here, I did, and we were able to go ahead and hold that meeting and to go ahead and let the EPA know about the problems we're facing. 
and all the problems that we were facing, so many people came in talking about their issues and about our heritage, our culture. There's a, there's a cave that's right off our reservation, but it's still, our, it's still a part of our, who we are. Now that land is, uh, that cave that's been documented to have from archaeologists from UNLV to go ahead and show that it is, there is a place in there that has uh, corn, pottery, that dates back to even the Anasazi tribe that used to go ahead and, for the nomadic tribes that have been around that area. And now that area is blocked off from us. So now we're losing our culture too. And now we're going to go ahead and we're, now our environment is happening, and the problems with that and the health problems we're facing there too with our people. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was that we wanted to go ahead and provide an alternate uh, solution. We wanted to show the corporate people out there that there's a, alternate ways to produce power without destroying the earth, without destroying the air, without destroying the water, land, plants, and animals. And we wanted to go ahead and do that by providing solar. And as it was said in the documentary that we were starting to go ahead and work on a solar plant. As of October last year, we did get our power purchase agreement with LADWP, and we are in construction right now to build one of the first solar scale industrial sky, uh, or solar, uh, industrial scale solar park in Indian country. We are the first. And we're showing that to other tribes out there that there's alternate ways to produce energy. We're trying to show them that we have to protect our land. Best way to protect our land is to go ahead and show that by demonstration. We're providing that template for other tribes out there for them to follow us for what we're trying to do. We want to show that we are proud people of who we are. We really are proud of our land. We are proud of our people, heritage, and culture. Everything you see in this room, that's who our people are. And this is what we're trying to do to go ahead and fight back and take back our land fight back and take back the environment the way it should be done. And that's the way we have to do it now. Other ways that have not worked in the past, but now a lot of people are gaining attention of what we're trying to do. People are under, you know, we're just a small tribe. 340 around people we have that are enrolled members there. Very small. Out in the middle of the desert, out in the middle of nowhere. Now we're in magazines. Now we're in newsletters. Now uh, I was to get invited to places like this, to get invited to go ahead and speak before Senate, invited to go ahead and speak before Congress. This is where we've been at right now. This is, the, this is how long it's been taken for us to go ahead and get to the point to let people see the problems that we're facing and as well to provide solutions. And again, thank, I wanna thank everybody for your here. Thank you for inviting me to come out here to speak again. And I uh, hope you all have a good day. My name is William Anderson, Chairman for my band Paiutes. Thank you. Thank you, William. A really, really powerful story, and, and I think that it will be very exciting to look at the kinds of solutions that are going to come from Indian country that in terms of showing that leadership and that kind of oneness with the land. Now I would like to turn to Joseph Reed, who is a policy analyst with NAACP, and, uh, and as you had heard, since we have so many oldest largest widely recognized uh, civil rights organizations uh, here in the U.S. and NAACP is certainly one of those critically important voices. And Joseph has a very broad portfolio within the office here in, in Washington in the National Public Policy Division where he works on health, international affairs, economy, environment, housing, labor, transportation and social security. But I think as we look at all of these issues, we see how intertwined they all are because our world is indeed a holistic one and that's the best way for us to both address issues and to find solutions. All right. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'll be reading to you a statement from the NAACP's Senior Vice President for Advocacy and Policy, uh, Hillary Shelton, who unfortunately could not be here today uh, he's actually overseas in Geneva, Switzerland at the uh, UN Human Rights Council. Climate change is a crucial issue facing our world today. Communities of color have historically experienced environmental inequalities more than any other group of Americans. They have been and continue to be exposed to more pollution through the air they breathe, the water they drink, and the food they eat. Furthermore, they have less access to resources to mitigate these problems, including adequate health care. One need to look no further than New Orleans, 
where the majority of those who lost everything, including in some cases their lives in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina, were African American. The effects of the changing climate are bad enough in themselves more frequent hurricanes and droughts, burning temperatures, uh, new plagues, diseases, and worse floods, for instance. But the general failure to recognize and respond to minorities resulting problems greatly exacerbates their suffering. Disadvantage and discrimination affect them at every stage, including in the immediate aftermath of climate-related disasters and during official planning at local, national, and international uh, levels for coping with the current and future impacts of climate change. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to report that the plight of low-income people and communities of color is beginning to attract some much-needed attention. Uh, as one report by the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights found, and I'm going to paraphrase this, minorities among the, the, the worst affected, the effects of the changing climate are bad enough in themselves, but the inability to recognize and respond to their problems worsens their suffering. Yet there is much more to be done. We must continue to publicize not only the desperate impact of the climate change phenomenon on racial and ethnic minorities, but we must continue to clamor loudly for action to mitigate climate change. We must call on our elected officials to base all the policy, whether they are related to energy, uh, the environment, housing, foreign affairs, or any other subject on the very real effects of climate change. We must begin to look forward. We must pass progressive policies which will address climate change. Until that time, we must also make plans to equitably mitigate the impact of climate change. We must prepare for the impact of hurricanes, floods, and drought. We must figure out how we will address the urban heat island effect which is a phenomenon that makes urban areas hotter than outlying regions, and by which it is estimated that African Americans are about 150% to 200% more likely to die of heat than Caucasians. We must, put place, we must put policies in place which provide assistance to those who cannot afford skyrocketing heating costs associated with increased cold, as well as help those who cannot endure higher temperatures due to climate change. We must do more not only to combat climate change, but until we adequately tackle the scourge, we should do what we can to minimize the harm inflicted. Uh, and thank you so much to the Friends Committee and EESI uh, for participating in this important briefing and taking the views of the NAACP in consideration. Uh, again, my boss, uh, Hillary Shelton, he's incredibly sorry he couldn't be here uh, in person to share this uh, crucial information sharing session, but he wants you to know if you can carry just one message, just one message uh, from today. He thinks it should be that climate change is a crucial issue facing our world today, and sadly, like most serious problems facing this world, it has a desperate impact on racial and ethnic minorities, as well as low-income Americans. Thank you, and you will find copies of Hillary's statement out on the table. Some of you probably already have it, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. We'll now turn to Shamar Bibbins. Uh, who is the Senior Political Associate of Green for All. Uh, Green for All is a national organization built around the whole theme of, of working to uh, really build an inclusive green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. Uh, Shamar brings with her also a background in small business and has worked with many different kinds of partners across the federal government at the state and local level, uh, collaborating with many people, different kinds of organizations, as well as government in terms of building 
uh, alliances and, and workforce projects. Shamar. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I first would like to just start by saying thank you and extending thanks that we, that we have already heard, but I really am honored to be here with this great panel, and I'm so happy that we're having this conversation. So I want to say thank you to ESS, EESI again, um, the Friends Committee, the National Con Congress of American Indians, and everyone else who just put whatever it took to put, make this briefing possible today. Um, so as you already heard, Green for All is a national organization whose mission is to build an inclusive green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. And so what that means is that we are working to build a new economy in America where everybody has access to opportunity and that the earth is sustained. And so our vision for, for, for moving this mission forward is ensuring that uh, we are improving environmental quality in communities that are most affected by climate change, poverty, and unemployment, but also by harnessing the, the growth of the clean energy economy. And so I want to talk a little bit about today our vision for how we feel, um, our vision for moving, for fighting climate change, but also how fighting climate change can really create jobs and economic opportunities for communities of color. So we've heard a lot, obviously, about the impacts and the threats and the challenges. We know that communities of color have long been suffering the health effects that um, climate altering pollution causes. 68% um, of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. And so we know that coal is a big, one of the biggest causes of climate change. So it's no surprise that African American um, children suffer asthma at rates much higher than the national average. Um, we know from Hurricane Katrina that neighborhoods with the fewest resources have the hardest time escaping and surviving and recovering from national disasters. Um, Joe mentioned the issue of, of heat islands. If you're African American, you live in Los Angeles, you're, 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 you're twice as likely to die from heat islands as well as a national average of one to two more times of dying from heat islands heat islands um, for communities of color. So we certainly, certainly know that climate change is much more than just an environmental issue. It's a human and civil rights issue and it's an economic issue for all communities, but especially for communities of color and low income communities because we are hit first and worse from the impacts. And so at Green for All, we have a vision of how tackling climate change can really help spur job creation and, and economic opportunities. And so our vision is very simple and, and it touches upon four points of how um, we can create jobs, build strong, healthy communities while also talking tackling climate change. And this really is rooted in our work around harnessing and moving forward the clean energy economy. And so first and foremost, uh, we've, we've heard already from, uh, from Representative Gravalia as well but, and from others, but the first and most important thing is holding fossil fuel industries accountable for their pollution. We must and we have to continue to say no to dirty energy projects that are going to continue to threaten our communities. We have to say yes to clean energy projects, to, to solar and to renewables. Um, holding fossil fuel industries accountable also means that we, you know, we're, we're advocating for ending, ending subsidies so that we're not giving polluters just free giveaways. We can save $8 billion a year by just eliminating subs oil and gas subsidies. Also, holding polluters accountable means that we should continue to advocate for a smart pricing structure on carbon for the industries. One point $1.25 trillion we could save and generate revenue by just putting $20 um, per ton of, of fee on carbon pollution. And I know there are other um, uh, provisions and legislation out there for even higher, so that's even greater. But just for $20, we can have $125 trillion over 10 years. We can use these savings to reinvest in clean energy projects or for other projects that we need to continue to move um, our, our economy forward that are on the, ch on the chopping block. Um, second, we need to protect our communities from the effects of climate change. We need to make sure that our communities are prepared for the next Sandy, the next Katrina. Even if we, if we, can, if we have 100% um, uh, effect, if we're 100% effective at stopping carbon pollution, we still need to make sure our communities are strong and resilient to face extreme weather conditions. Um, it's no secret that our infrastructure is declining and it's crumbling if we just look at our water infrastructure alone. Every year, 75, we have 75,000 sewer overflows a year. 
75,000, that's, that's a huge number. 3.5 million, million Americans get sick from swimming in contaminated water because we have declining and crippling infrastructure. Climate change, droughts, floods are just going to continue to put strain and stress on an already crumbling infrastructure. So we need to make sure that we're investing in, in our infrastructure and making, and making sure that communities are prepared. Um, the EPA estimates that if we invest $188 um, billion just for basic repairs to our water infrastructure, that would translate into 2 million jobs. So there's an opportunity there to, to strengthen, make our communities resilient, but also spur job creation. Um, third, we need to make sure that we're accelerating the transition to clean energy and energy efficiency, which again fights climate change and it puts people back to work in healthy, high wage jobs. The clean energy sector creates three times as many jobs per dollar as fossil fuels. So just a, a single 250 megawatt wind farm employs about 1,000 people. So if we transition just to producing 20% of our total power to wind, that's about 500,000 good, good, healthy, clean jobs. Um, and 20%, that's, that's an achievable goal I think we can reach for. Um, with regard to energy efficiency, by upgrading just 40% of the country's residential and commercial building stock, that's about 625 long-term, full-time, and again, clean jobs that are not putting, putting pollution and straining already stressed uh, communities. And these are jobs that can't be shipped overseas when we know that when you're, you're, doing, when, when you're doing energy efficiency upgrades, you also uh, make a, put a nudge into our manufacturing sector because when you think about um, the materials that are used for uh, energy efficiency upgrades, mo lar by lar largely these are uh, materials that are created here in the United States. And then finally, we need to make sure that vulnerable communities have access to the opportunities in the clean energy economy. And this is an area that Green Fraud is, is, is very much rooted in. Um, it's not enough for us just to accelerate the growth, but we just need to, we need to make sure that people who need the jobs the most, that they have access to the jobs. Um, we, we find that one of the most important ways to make sure that we're um, providing an inclusive green economy is around higher road strategies. So this is around making sure that when new green projects are, uh, are rolled out, that local and disadvantaged workers have access to these, to these jobs. Um, we also need to make sure that we're advocating for uh, continued training in job, in, in job investment and in, in, in workforce training so that we can continue to make sure that people who need the training and the jobs the most, that they are trained properly and there's, there's opportunities for them to transition into clean power and energy efficiency and green infrastructure. And we also need to make sure that the workers in coal and, and, and oil aren't left behind either. So as, they're tra trans as we're transitioning to a cleaner economy, we need to make sure that we are retraining and retooling workers who have risked their lives and risked their health for years to work in these industries um, and so that they, they come out to be really win to be winners um, in the clean energy economy. So these four points are, are our vision for how we can tackle climate change, but also create jobs that are clean and healthy and have good wages that will continue to um, grow our economy. We are continuing, we work very, very hard with um, members of Congress and mayors and public utility co uh, companies, green business owners, we work very closely with to make sure that they have the right contracting opportunities. Oh, and, and until we see movement across all four of these points, we won't be satisfied and we will continue to advocate for these measures and more. Um, communities of color and low income communities are on the front lines and we just, we really need to make sure that these communities are a part of the solution and that their voices and their interests and their perspectives are, are have a continual drumbeat around the national climate um, dialogue. And thank you all so much. And our final panelist is Anthony Giancatatieri. Jan Caterino, who is the coordinator of research and advocacy with the Center for Social Inclusion. And CSI is a nonprofit policy strategy and advocacy organization that works with communities of color on transforming barriers into opportunities through policy change. Anthony? And thank you all again very much. As everyone has a sense of their appreciation, I also uh, appreciate the opportunity. And I also want to thank William and Jacqueline for sharing your stories because they're very powerful stories. Um, and so it's just, it's, I think it's a good reminder of where we are and, and the innovation that communities are really trying to do to, to solve this problem. Again, uh, CSI, 
I'm not going to go too deep into it, but we are a policy strategy organization, and we really work on learning about what communities of color are doing to innovate, understand and identify what their barriers are to making change, and help support local leadership on the ground to actually creating solutions for change that can go from the local level to the federal level. Um, I'm going to go through some of these slides really quickly, but what we have right now is, you know, We've heard it in the news already, but there's going through a lot of demographic change, and by 2042, we will be a majority people of color nation. And that means communities of color are the drivers of our economy moving forward, and they need to be part of the solutions starting at day one, not as an after effect, not as being asked afterwards, but as really driving and innovating. And for CSI, what we find that is, it's going to be through a community scale approach. So that means, what does community scale mean? That means it could be a neighborhood, it could be a block-by-block -block approach, or it could be larger projects on, you know, in, in, in uh, Indian country. But it's like communities are actually owning, operating, and are the deciders in the renewable energy future. So the power is actually in the community. It's kind of shifting that away from putting out to only individuals, putting out to only industry, but actually putting it back into communities. And for us to get there, we really not need to overcome a lot of different barriers. Um, and so... This, if you can, sorry, just go to real quick. We're going to skip that real quick. Sorry. This is being on PowerPoint. So this slide right here is a picture of solar potential in the United States. And there's uh, some hash marks, which shows majority communities of color. And you can tell the deepest potential is actually where majority of people of color live. All right, so this is just kind of remember this image for one second. So the next slide is showing you where solar projects are really happening. And if anyone sees anything, let me know. Catch anything? Most projects are happening in Minnesota, Vermont, the Northeast. California is the exception in this, but for the most part, where people of color are living, are not happening. But that's where the potential is. So there's a huge disconnect that's actually happening right now in the country. And there's a lot of policy that drives that. It's local policy, it's state policy, and it's federal policy. I'm not going to go into local and state right now, um, but this is an issue that needs to be changed. And we know communities of color really have a lot of assets to produce, uh, to provide. Um, so they've been climate activists in, in the past, and they've been driving change in California alone. Communities of color have been leading the charge for climate change um, reform and adaptation planning and renewables. Uh, you have a lot of local leadership really innovating and doing a lot of work. And there's a lot of you know, ideas and innovation, as you just learned from earlier today from Jacqueline and William. The communities of color are really innovating and trying to find a new way to make change. And lastly, communities of color really have a lot of infrastructure. So, uh, for example, Black Mesa in, in Arizona is, has a huge Navajo generating power plant that they're also trying to close. And they want to turn that into solar, and they have the assets there because it's, the power lines are already set up, everything's in place. They just want to transition from coal to solar and tr transition those jobs from coal to solar jobs. And that's what they're working on. So they're innovating and they're really working on their potential. Um, but there's a couple, few barriers. Sorry, just go a couple slides more, sorry. All right, so a couple of quick barriers that you've all heard, but we've been doing a lot of different case studies with communities on the ground, trying to really learn what's the challenges, why come, how come a lot of these innovative ideas are not transitioning into actual solutions, and they're running up to a lot of things. So one, federal policy really values individual ownership, individual property, individual action. And that's not going to work necessarily for a lot of communities of color, because communities of color, 50% are likely not to own a home or own property, compared to 25% of white communities. So therefore, if you don't own property, you don't have access to ownership, you can't partake in this renewable energy future for the, in most of the country. It's really difficult. So we need to be able to transition that from individual focus to community focus. So that means allowing people to pull together their assets, use brownfields as a solar site, use the schools, use churches, use different places that communities can come together and invest together and turn into some type of solar or geothermal or wind, depending on where you are. Uh, another barrier is around a lot of inclusion in the planning process. So there's tons of energy planning going on in the country. We're based in New York. They have a Plan NYC 2030, which is focusing on making New York a very green city. They have not engaged communities of color from step one. They've kind of added them in here and there on the, on the side, but they're really not part of the process. And, and there's a community in Brooklyn that was trying to create an energy district hub that would create housing, jobs, and fight climate change. It would have been a huge add-on, like huge addition to this plan NYC uh, to really support, to move those goals, and they were ignored. So that needs to change. We need a lot of transparency and a lot of account accountability at the local level. Um, the third barrier is around a lot of around, like lack of technical or legal assistance. 
Uh, so right now, it's, you need to do a lot with different businesses or different legal entities to get things off the ground. So it needs to be more dedicated support and resources in there. And the last and the most important barrier that people face is lack of access to financing. So we really need to find ways to help support communities, get this upfront capital to be able to move forward. Uh, and, that's, and that's the key, and people are really trying to figure that out. Uh, so at CSI, we have tons of solutions, but the, the three very brief that I'm just gonna talk about, and I can talk afterwards as well, is one, um, the way to kind of help transition this from individual to community is this idea of a, a national feed-in tariff. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance has been pushing this, and we would just add on to their push on saying they should be really targeted to communities of color, environmental just, uh, justice communities, communities that have really been left off and not part of the solutions in the past, should be getting these opportunities to create these clean contracts with utilities or with states or with um, local governments to get paid for the solar they create. That doesn't happen in every state. California's been pushing it, uh, and it was called Solar for All, which is led by the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. They had a huge role in trying to push the Solar for All legislation. It failed at the very end, but it had this great idea of really targeting um, clean energy contracts in communities of color to use, to use their resources. Uh, the second one is a, an idea that we're pushing called energy independence districts, and EIDs for short. And that basically is a very specific place-based solution that's going to target investment, um, resources, technical assistance, combine a lot of social entrepreneurs who, want, who have a lot of money to actually fund projects, but they don't know how to do it or don't know where to do it. So it's trying to bring that private sector dollars in, connecting it to community control, community ownership, and community decision making. Um, and we can definitely talk more about that afterwards in a little more detail. Um, but these, we're asking for the EPA and, and the Department of Energy to actually come together to do some pilots. I mean, you need the support of Congress to actually push, push that through. And the last is just kind of jumping on President Obama's recent claims for the Energy Trust, is he wants to do it only for research around fuel efficient cars, which is really important. But if you're putting $2 billion into that, we're saying, why don't we reserve some for actually clean energy that can happen right now? So instead of just researching what cars can do, people can do solar, people can do wind, people can do geothermal, they can do energy efficiency. They have the technology, they have the skill set, they have the tools. They just need some of the financing. So we need to be shifting some of that financing towards that as well. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and I'll definitely be here around to talk after. So thank you. We just have a few minutes left, but we can take a few questions. And again, I also just wanted to say thank you very much to Senator Cantwell's office and her staff for helping make sure that this very appropriate room was available for today's briefing, looking at these impacts upon communities of color and what it means with regard to climate and how to better address solutions. Any questions or comments? And if you could just identify yourself, please. Okay, we'll start here. If you can keep your questions pretty brief since we don't have much time. <coughs> Yes, I'm Ted Riley from Friends House Retirement Center, member of Friends Committee on National Legislation. I would just like to ask the members who are on the panel uh, why we haven't heard uh, the panelists uh, uh, in their uh, presentations to go back to Senator Kerry's nomination hearing where he replied to a question on Keystone Pipeline. He gave uh, an excellent uh, contrast between uh, the pipeline and green energy alternatives. Okay, who wants to comment on that? Does, does anybody? Okay. Could you put your mic on, please? Use maybe Williams or, or Anthony's. Anyhow, I would just say, I think it's a good point. Uh, and when I remarked around our first point or around holding dirty, I was specifically talking about a holding dirty down pipeline. And that is a, obviously an immediate project that we just we can't support that. And so instead of investing in something like that, Threaten our, our community, have temporary jobs. We need to be 
taking that same energy and investing in them. So I think that that is definitely, um, you know, our 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 platform and um, we support clean energy projects. So yeah, it's a good one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and I should respond to that too. Um, NAP NCAI has a resolution opposing Keystone um, from the tribes. Um, our concern really is a couple things. And we've had meetings with the State Department. We've worked with the tribes. In fact, we're getting right now another teleconference with the tribes getting a new proposed plan. Um, we've got a map overload, overlay of the proposed project and the tribal community. They're, even though they've done a even though they've done a great, ooh, um, <laughs> even though they've done a great job as at least trying to map around tribal communities, um, there still is some overlap. So that's one issue. And how is the tribe going to that affect the tribe that's affected? Addressing that. Second issue is really the aquifer. That aquifer that actually helps su support and sustain those tribal communities is at risk. And the tribes, the the basis for our concern of of the issue from the inception is really that the tribal leaders questions on the um, protections and the science around um, those protections in place um, have not been thoroughly answered to the tribal leaders themselves to make them feel comfortable that they won't have a problem with um, some kind of leakage into the aquifer or corrosion of the pipes. Question over here. Uh, thank you. I'm Russell Emery. I'm a member of Gunawagi Mohawk Nation, uh, First Nation. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a question for Mr. Anderson. Um, you referred to the river that flows through uh, your reserve and uh, down to Las Vegas. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the reduction in the snowpack from climate change in the Sierra Nevada for all the eastward flowing rivers to uh, like Pyramid Lake, Walker Lake, Mono Lake, and so forth? Yeah, that has been a big issue that's been going on in the state of Nevada, has been water. Uh, one of the things that they've been trying to do also is that they're trying to go ahead and get a pipeline from up uh, from Las Vegas to northern Nevada. And it is going to be taking a lot of water from up there that's going to affect a lot of the tribes in the community. Um, the Goshu tribe is one of them. They're, they're, they're going to have a main impact on their tribe because all their farming and everything they have out there resides on, on water. And it's not going to just take away from that aquifer, but it's going to do from the surrounding communities as well. So it's not just the tribes that are facing this, but it's also the other people around the surrounding areas. Our area, uh, we do have a large aquifer that we do have in place also, but it still is being pumped out. Um, MV Energy, the, the power plant that I'm in, in question has been buying all the water rights surrounding the tribe above us. So they're pumping the water from up above around there to go ahead and go around the reservation back to their place too. And we try to go ahead and we, we want to be involved, but again, it's always a jurisdiction issue that comes up saying it's not our jurisdiction. That comes up each time. Uh, every department we try to talk to from the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection to e, uh, EPA, uh, it always falls into the same category. But we always try to go ahead and show, tell them about the problems that we're facing. And since uh, to us, it's water is gold out there. And we want to make sure that we protect all our rights. And we want to make sure that the surrounding tribes are involved with the talk as well. I, I know a few of them are, are doing a lot of work on their side too. But um, so far, it, it's just uh, another battle that we've been facing right now. But uh, we're, we're still trying to address it. Great. Thank you. Any last question? Okay, last question over here. Hi there, my name is Eric Miller. I'm, with, I'm a student at American University. I was recently working with Mr. Reed at the NAACP. I'm curious to know what your guys' thoughts are on the um, leadership changes at the EPA with Lisa Jackson leaving and Gina McCarthy likely coming in. How do you think that affects the, um, all the great work that Jackson was doing on the Office of Environmental Justice and how changes at the federal level are are affecting the work you guys are doing. I think everyone kind of wants to. Okay. You, wanna, you go ahead, go ahead, start. I'll just start by saying, um, so, 
as many of us work very closely with the EPA, Green for All also works very closely with the EPA, and we, of course, are sad to see, um, have seen uh, former Administrator Jackson leave, I and mean, she was just such a jewel and so committed to our issues, and so it obviously, you know, is a, is a loss, but we know that um, soon to be a administrator, uh, Gina McCarthy will, you know, we feel very strongly that she will continue to um, pu push forward and move forward on, on much of the groundwork that, um, that Lisa Jackson laid at the EPA. And so we feel very confident that she will, you know, be a great um, leader in, in her, in her right into in that new position. So I don't know. I guess I just want to add one thing. You know, we see transition all the time, and it's really important that we have sustainable policies. And so, you know, Lisa was great. She came out to Indian country. She was a great voice for us. But beyond that, we need to be able to make sure that those policies are in place at those agencies. For the way I look at it is, you know, I look at the federal government as a whole. And right now, because the president cares about things like climate change, and he said it in his remarks, because he cares around things about energy, there's a lot of agencies that are hopping on board and saying, oh, we're going to, we're going to be the energy agency of Interior, because, you know, Department of Interior, BIA, uh, and Department of Energy. Um, and, and I think most of all is beyond what they do as initiatives, but how can we really create the framework that will last beyond any administration? And that's where we really need to be focusing our energies. Well, the, one of the problems that we've been facing was trying to go ahead and have a meeting with Lisa Jackson. We never had the opportunity. We always try to go ahead and make, a, make time for her. Um, Senator Reed personally written her a letter to go ahead and arrange for a meeting to be, to be set up on the or to, with either reservation or for us to come out here. Every time, we wouldn't hear nothing. Uh, we've been having a big problem in our region, in Region 9. Uh, the BART regulations regarding regard, or the Regardner plant, they weren't as tight as they were across the country and that, that allows them to go and continue on to, to keep the power plant as it is and we've been trying to go ahead and push it as much as we could but we still have are facing these problems with our with the the BART regulation and right now the only person that really has been listening to us has been Gina uh, every time we try to set up a meeting here in DC it was with Gina and she's been able to, she's been the one that's been actually listening to our tribe on our issues that we're facing regarding the coal plant so it's really, when I heard that, I was just like, wow. I go, geez, I was just talking to her last year about this here in D.C. And I'm like, oh, it just to me, it felt, I felt really good about it because it was somebody that was actually listening to our comments. Again, our small little tribe that was able to go ahead and listen to us. Actually, through her, she was the one that was able, actually able to go ahead and get arranged to have that meeting set up on the reservation. Uh, I mean, when I was sitting right across from her at the desk and to hear the region nine people talking on the conference call and and um, having her sitting right there next to me and i'm like you know i couldn't believe the excuses they were giving and i'm telling her i go this is the kind of issues we've been dealing with with region nine but uh i'm, I'm glad that she's going to be coming on board and I'm, I'm you know looking looking forward for this great thank you very very much and i think that as has been clear with regard to all of the comments from all of our panelists. Climate is an enormous issue that is confronting all of us uh, across the country, and it is hitting some communities harder than others as we look at more and more extreme weather events, and we've already seen the impacts uh, in many areas of our country with regard to that. Um, I think that it's very, very clear that there is so much work to be done and that it is very important that all of these voices, as a democracy, it's so important that all of these voices keep coming forward over and over again as we look for solutions for the country as a whole. So I want to thank all of you very, very much for being here. The information from the briefing will be up on EESI's website, and so people are welcome to, to link to that. And I want to thank all of our presenters very, very much and all of our sponsoring organizations. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>